Welcome everybody to a new chapter of Un Topo por el Mundo. Today we are going to speak in English again because we are going to have an interview with a really interesting person. He is Sam Ford Biner. As I showed you before, I made a video about the Jews of Harpin, but many people ask me, where are the Jews? So I said the Jews left Harpin and the last family left the city in 1963. But a few weeks ago, I was giving a lecture for a really interesting organization. The name is Kesher. They, during the lockdown, started to teach online and show the different Jewish life around the world. And I was showing them about the Jewish life in China. And there was a person participating that raised the hand and said, I was born in Harpin, China. He's 95 years old and he was really kind to accept to be interviewed for me. We are going to contact him right now and I'm going to ask him how was the life of the Jew and the Jewish community in China. So, Mr. Weiner, I want to welcome here to this interview. I am really happy to have you here with me. Hello, how are you? Fine, fine, really fine. Really happy to have you here. I want to hear about his history, about his, his life. He was born in Harbin, so I want to know all the background, how their family arrived to, to China, and then how was his childhood over there. My mother and her family ran away from the pogroms in Kishinev, Russia. There were very bad pogroms in 1902 and 1905. So they ran away to Harbin, China. Many people left from Russia in order to come to America where you needed the different documents in order to come to Harbin, China with the railroad across Siberia. All you needed was the railway uh, ticket and Harbin became a very viable Russian Jewish city. Also, the white Russians, Belaruski, they also ran away to Harbin. My mother came there as a young girl. I would guess before the Russian Revolution, let us assume 1910. And she was born 1899, so she was around 11 years old. My father did the similar exit. I don't know if there was any pogroms or not in Tiraspol, but he and his uh, family also emigrated to Harbin together with two other brothers. So he was about roughly 10 years older than my mother. My mother was working in the jewelry concession of Hotel Modern, which was the most luxurious hotel in all of China, was built and operated by a French Jew from 1905, and the facade of that uh, hotel is still there. So my father and mother married around 1918. Their first child, my sister, was born in 1920. Unfortunately, she died from a domestic accident in 1924. She was four years old. My brother was born in 1923, and I was born in September of 1925. Growing up, uh, I attended a Russian school for a year or two, and in 1932, my father moved to Tenzin. Tenzin had a viable Jewish population similar to Harbin and Shanghai, only on a smaller scale. My father, his brother, and a few other partners operated a chain of four banks. We came to Tenzin in 1932. There was a Tenzin Jewish school. I did not go there. I went to the Tenzin Grammar School. It was a British school. Life was very good there. My father was doing quite well. We were quite comfortable until 1936. Unfortunately, he caught a virus and he passed away. Then my mother and I, we moved back to Harbin. 
for two years. Then again, we moved back to Tenzin, 1938 to 1940. And in 1940, my uncle, who became our guardian, he lived in Shanghai, requested that we move to Shanghai. And I lived there from 1940 to 1947. I emigrated to United States as a foreign student. I want to know which was your first language. Well, first of all, my native language was Russian, and I started learning English when I came to Tenzin. In Harbin, you spoke a few words. It was called Pidgin English or Pidgin Russian. In other words, just to get along, if you had to buy something or if you had to tell them, tell the rickshaw where to go. On the other hand, in Harbin was very strong uh, Russian influence. So the people that you encountered, especially the trade people or the servants, they knew some Russia. How was uh, the normal life in, in China for a Jew? Beginning the first Jew from Mesopotamia or Mediterranean region that settled in Kaifeng was 960. And they assimilated and intermarried with the Chinese population. And then came the Sephardic Jews. Russian Jews and the European Jews. I would say they accepted us. The word that I like to use, they nurtured us. And all I have is uh, just gratitude for their relations with the uh, Jewish people. When Jewish life in Harbin centered around the clubs, but I was a young boy there, so uh, you know I was I was going to school. I was not in, involved. When you come to Tenzin, there was a Jewish club. It was called Kunst. For example, uh, my father closed the office at four o'clock. He would go to the club and they played cards, dominoes, and mahjong, and then. About six o'clock, he goes home and has his dinner. In Shanghai, there was a very large, huge Jewish club, which was taken away by the Japanese. So then we moved to a smaller club, and that club also had facilities. However, for the young people like myself and my brother and our peers, uh, we all had a very interesting life in a organization called Betar. is a youth movement of the Zionist uh, revisionist movement, which is now Likud in Israel. So in Betar, we had social, we had lectures, that we had plays, and we had dances, and we would put on uh, different uh, activities, including nightclub activities, to collect money. We collected money in U.S. dollars, and all of that went to Irgun, so that the Irgun could purchase ammunition. Also, we would put on uniforms and march in the streets of Harbin, Tenzin, and Shanghai with the Israeli flags. It was a semi-military organization. Life was quite good for the young people. You could not, during the Japanese occupation, you were not allowed to go outside. So uh, in the summer, since we could not go to any summer resorts, we went to school so that I graduated uh, St. John's University in uh, three years instead of uh, four years. Uh, you also told me that your family sadly passed away in China, so I wonder where they were buried. My sister was buried in Harbin, and I believe that your lecture was very emphatic because the Harbin uh, cemetery mostly was uh, not destroyed, it was just transferred. My father, unfortunately, was buried in 
Tenzin, and that cemetery was destroyed by the youth guards. I think it's called xenophobic or whatever. They, they were against anything foreign, and for some reason, they destroyed it. And I believe that uh, they also destroyed the Shanghai uh, cemetery. How was the, your relationship with the Chinese people around the Jewish community? How was the relationship with Chinese and Jewish people? The relationship of the Jewish community versus the Chinese, I would say, was an employer and employee. For example, uh, my father and mother had three servants. One was the chauffeur, and then we had a cook, and we had a nama. So actually, the, there is no specific or relationship with them. My only interconnection with them is when I came to Shanghai and I was attending St. John's University. I made a couple of Chinese friends. I would go to their house to do our schoolwork and they would come to our schoolwork. My father in Tenzin and my uncle in Shanghai had a business relationship with them. Uh, you mentioned about the mixed marriage of the Kaifan Jews. So I want to know during your time if it was some mixed marriage in that time. We know officially we say no, but maybe you know about some marriage that were mixed. I really don't remember any mixed marriages. And just as a sideline, there was a few Russian Jews that left their Jewish wife, family and wives and they married Japanese women. Personally, I know at least three people, Jap but I don't know the mixed marriages in China. You have mentioned about the Japanese invasion, so I wanted to ask you about it because in 1932, Japan invaded a Manchuria area where it's Harpin, and then later in 1937, invaded Shanghai. So you have lived through Japanese invasion, and also in 1943, Japan uh, developed a ghetto in Shanghai. So I want to ask you about the Jew Japanese invasion. How do you live that? And also, if you have lived the ghetto time in Shanghai. So they occupied the surrounding areas around Harbin, but did not enter it until uh, World War II started. The same thing happened with Shanghai. They also were uh, surrounding the Shanghai. They occupied the Chinese territories, but they did not enter Tenzin or Shanghai because it was the uh, foreign uh, territorial uh, rights of uh, England, United States, and other uh, European nations. After Pearl Harbor, that's when the Japanese entered uh, Shanghai. Actually, during the war, they did not bother or interfere with the Russian Jewish population, and they took away all public transportation. So if you had to go somewhere, you used your bicycle or if people had cars. When the European Jews uh, began to come to Shanghai, they started, I believe, 37, 38. At first, they could live anywhere in the international concession until the Germans pressured them around, I believe, 1943 when they had to go and live in Hongqiu. Hongqiu was a small area surrounded by Chinese nationals. These Chinese were themselves nearly at the poverty level, but they were very nice, and they helped the European refugees, mostly from uh, Germany, Austria, and Poland, organized their own schools, their own hospital, their own restaurants and cafes. It became known as Little Vienna. Their only uh, restrictions were that there was a curfew. 
So if they had a job outside, they had to be back uh, at a certain time. If you disobey the curfew, uh, the Japanese officer could slap you around. Perhaps some of them went to jail, but otherwise most of those Jews survived. Two famous diplomats that saved a lot of lives. First one was Shigihara, who was a diplomat in the consulate in Lithuania. He saved over 6,000 Jews by giving them uh, passports and visas to come to Shanghai. And in Vienna, there was Dr. Ho, who was also a diplomat. He gave out more than 10,000 visas and he saved all those people who came to Shanghai. Both of these diplomats did this on their own against the regulations of their government, but eventually the Japan and China acknowledge that they did the right thing. I want to know a little bit more about the life there during the ghetto time. Since we were what is called stateless white Russians, it was a community roughly maybe 25,000 Russian Jews. You were allowed to live anywhere you want. I and my mother and my brother, we lived in the international concession. It was uh, Avenue Road, corner Seymour Road. My uh, uncle, who was my guardian with his family, lived in the French concession. As I said, the Japanese really did not bother us that much. Our relations with the foreign, the uh, ghetto, were not that extensive. Sometimes from our youth club, Bitar, we would go there on a bicycle and we would play soccer against them and ping pong. Otherwise, maybe some of them would come for employment by the Russian uh, Jews. They had sort of their own life and we had uh, our own uh, life. And then after the world and the world ends, how the life became in Shanghai? The, after the end of the World War, uh, when the Japanese uh, left, came the Chinese Nationalist Government under uh, Chiang Kai-shek. But as everybody knows, uh, his government was corrupt, and that would be one reason why the Chinese Communists uh, were uh, successful. So why do you decide to move to United States in that time? The main reason was because actually nobody wanted to remain in China because they knew that the communists were arriving. Our parents or grandparents initially, years ago, ran away from communism. Although the Chinese never exhibited any anti-Semitism at all. However, they just did not want to remain in order to live under uh, communism. I left in May of 1947. Uh, my brother left before me and my mother came in uh, 1948. The communists, from what I read, entered uh, Shanghai in 1949. By that time, the majority of the Europeans, including the Jewish people, uh, left Shanghai. The majority of the Jewish people left for Israel, and the rest came wherever they could find a visa. They went to United States, Canada, Australia. Why uh did you choose uh, United States? Why did we choose United States? <laughs> well, I guess what we read and what we knew about America, it was the uh, best place to go, I guess, as opposed to uh, going to Israel. And I, I think that the language, we didn't know any Hebrew. I mean, uh, you know, we were just bar mitzvah, that's all. Here we knew the uh, English language, and 
we both graduated at St. John's University in Shanghai, which was an American university. In order to come to United States as a foreign student, uh, my brother and I needed a passport. We did not have any. The uh, papers that we had, stateless white Russian, were completely useless. At that time, the Russian consulate began to issue passports to people of Russian origin. My brother and I were never in Russia. However, our parents are from there. So we went to the consulate and asked them to give us passports. They said, why do you need it? Because we want to come to the States in order to study. They said, what will you do when you graduate? And we said that we will come to Russia, which was complete nonsense because nobody wants to go there. And of course, once we became citizens, we discarded the Russian passports. What do you do uh, when you arrived to United States? I came to under the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a uh, phenomenal experience, and uh, lived in San Francisco for about five days. So I was accepted to the University of uh, California at Berkeley, and I was thinking of uh, studying there. My brother was in New York, and uh, he said, don't... Uh, stay there, you hardly know anybody, come to New York, which I did, and I went to Long Island University in Brooklyn, uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting, and uh, I became a controller and a treasurer in my professional life. And uh, in New York, I met a wonderful uh, uh, girl. We were married in uh, 1950, and uh, we were married from 1950 to 20. 20 when my uh, wife uh, passed away. Once you were in the United States, did you have you been in contact with people from Harpin that has communities there and people from Shanghai that have community there too? No, we had no relationship. Most of them left. However, in Tel Aviv, they organized a society. It's called Igut, which is a society of the former residents of China. And this society is very interesting because every time that the Chinese diplomats come, they invite them. They publish a bulletin in three languages, Hebrew, English, and Russian, and they sponsor scholarships, more than 100 scholarships for the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those uh, people from China, including about one dozen Chinese, and they study in all the universities in Israel. Did you ever go back to China since you lived in the United States? No, I did not go back. My brother, has been back there when he was alive for business and pleasure. I want to know about your family in New York. You got married, as you told me, so you have how many childs and how, how do you develop your life there? How many grandchild? How is your life in New York? Well, after uh, I got married, we had uh, two wonderful children, my uh, daughter. I'm the best, right? But I'm the best. <laughs> the best daughter, the best daughter there is, with the best son-in-law, and uh, my son is the best, and uh, his uh, wife, uh, my daughter has uh, two children, and uh, they have two girls, and she no. has no, uh, four girls. Uh, no, there's four great granddaughters. Four great granddaughters. Two, two, <laughs> two, and, two. and the grandson, four great granddaughters. And my son has uh, one daughter. We lived in uh, Bro we lived in Brooklyn for many years. We lived in uh, Florida for twenty years, where we had a very uh, wonderful uh, life and a social life as a uh, controller and treasurer for about forty-seven uh, years until I uh, retired. 
So this is the first time you have done an interview in your life. That is, uh, that is correct. The first interview besides the lectures, uh, which I have uh, presented, uh, mostly all of them uh, in South Florida. It has been a pleasure for me, really a pleasure. I did really enjoy it. So I promise if I go to United States, I will go to New York, I will go to Long Island, and I will meet you there. Thank you so much. And as Russian is your mother tongue, I will say Spasiva. Pajavta. Pajavta. Thank you very much.